Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. i 
God's parents and him to die. I scarce can take it begin by saying this happy father's day to all the dads here as well as those who are watching on our live stream right now i hope you have a great day in which you are encouraged and prayed for uh, as uh, we are continue to walk through our sermon series called prove it we're coming to a text that is going to lend itself specifically uh towards father's day but not uh, to the exclusion of anyone else, I want to encourage you, if you've got your Bibles, let's go to 1 John chapter 2. Uh, now, I will go ahead and tell you here and online that we are going to split this text up into uh, two weeks, uh, simply because there is so much there, we don't want to rush ourselves through it. But, you know, as I begin to think about Father's Day and, and really prepare for this message, one thing that really saddens me about our society right now is that over the last couple of decades, uh, we have seen a very conscious effort out of Hollywood to diminish and to devalue dads. Now, I could probably uh, give you a lot of sociological evidence and facts to back that up, but instead, uh, I want to share kind of a personal story uh, that, uh, again, as I was, was reflecting and preparing, just kind of hit me in, honestly, a way I wasn't prepared for. Uh, see, I am one of the blessed few, uh, uh, fortunate ones, to still have my dad living. I, I can talk with him, uh, I can ask advice, and things uh, like that. Now, my dad is like most dads. Uh, 
He tells a lot of corny jokes, and he gives a lot of advice. Uh, I'm sure he learned that from his dad, and of course I've learned it from mine, and I'm passing it on to uh, my children as well. But I think the older that I've gotten, the thing that I miss the most was was conversations with my grandfather, my dad's dad. Now, full disclosure here. A lot of the advice that my grandpa gave me was the advice that my dad had given me as well. But you, you know how the, the teenager mind says parents are, you know, not as intelligent and don't really know it all. Um, there, Well, I was, I was a lot like that. And so I would really take advice from just about anybody as long as it wasn't, you know, my parents, specifically probably my, my father. Um, by the way, that is not honoring your father and mother, uh, children and, and teens here. So I want you to learn from that. Um, but I never really knew how much I missed just those everyday conversations with my grandpa. And again, they weren't, you know, those times they would say, all right, Justin, you need to sit down. I'm going to teach you something. It, it was just the everyday moments, you know, that I, I would get to talk with him. Maybe we were watching a ball game or, or whatever it happened to be. Now, my guess is everybody in here has somebody that they will listen to, somebody that can speak into their life and, and actually produce change. Now, it may not be your dad. It, it may not even be one of your parents, but there's somebody that, that you will listen to, you look up to. You know, and here's the thing about it. Most of the time, we don't realize who they are until they're no longer with us. And then we sit there and like, man, I really wish I could just have one more conversation. I wish I could just kind of talk this through with, with whoever that person is. Have you ever had uh, that moment? You know, I see my job as a dad to, to four great kids as sharing my faith and passing down Diana and I's values. Because that's going to be my legacy. The, the faith I pass on to Andrew, uh, Noah, Caleb, and Catalea, uh, the faith and the values, that's going to be something that far outlives anything they might get you know, when I'm no longer here. And that's what you and I need to understand this morning, church is that we are leaving a legacy, either good or bad. But when we're no longer here, our values, the way we live, the way we operated as a church, it's going to outlive us. As much as, you know, I, I love the biblical discussions I get to have with my boys and the questions and stuff, what I've really come to learn is that most of the passing on of information, mo most of those precious times actually happen in, in those moments that, let's be honest, dads, we take for granted. Or we just outright miss. The moments we, we don't realize that we missed until we look back. And we're like, man. I can't believe so much time has passed. You know, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated our oldest, uh, Andrew, turned 15. Uh, and here's the thing about it. Like, I can remember every moment of the day that Diana went into labor. From the moment her water broke all the way until the first time I got to hold Andrew in my hands. I could remember it vividly. And so I'm sitting here going, how is it I could remember that but I can't remember, you know, where I put the remote. Um, and by the way, how is it that I've got a 15-year-old? I mean, in three years, he's going to have graduated. And then stepping into whatever God has for him for, from there. Like, 15 years is gone. And we're going to see this in our text this morning. You see, John is writing as an aged spiritual father to children that he dearly loves. John knows 
The false teachers are going to be there. They are there. And, and they are going to use and exploit these believers. They're going to try to derail the faith of these believers. And, and so John knows he can't protect them from everything. But he wants to make sure that they know the most important thing. And that they are prepared for it. So before we get into the text, I just want to say this. Dads, don't try to give your kids everything. Don't try to protect them from everything, but make sure that you give them what they absolutely have to have. And that is the gospel in words and in actions. Why? Because here's the one big thing. As a father, God wants us to be secure in his love. Let's look at it together. First John chapter 2, I'm going to begin in verse 12. If you would stand as we honor the reading of God's word together. It says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him. That is, from the beginning, I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. That is, from the beginning, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you on this day, on this Father's Day. Uh, Lord, as we celebrate dads, God, may we thank you uh, for those godly dads who love their children, love their wives, invest in them uh, for gospel and, and kingdom work. But Father, maybe it's true that some are here or watching online that uh, they didn't have a father figure or a good father figure in their life. Uh, Lord, I pray that in these moments for these lives, God, that we would just point them to you, the greatest father of all. And that by pointing them to you, yes, they will see mercy and judgment and, and consequences. But they'll also find a loving, tender, merciful, gracious father. And so God, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the truth of your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As a father, God wants us to be secure in his love. Now, in these three short verses, John wants to explain why he is writing this letter. Now, there's three total reasons that John is writing in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to get to chapter, uh, reasons 2 and 3. Uh, Lord willing, next week. But we want to see this first one because, as you're going to see, it's foundational. So why did John write? He writes so that they will have a firm foundation. Okay, this would take us back to what Jesus said, uh, you know, if any man builds on the rock, right? The storms are going to come, the winds are going to blow, but his house is going to stand. Why? Because it's built on the rock. The rock is a reference specifically to faith in Jesus Christ. But to a Jewish person, when they hear the phrase, the rock, they automatically think God, okay? So he wants them to have a firm foundation in him. So how does he build it? Well, the first thing he says in verse 12 is this, you are forgiven. All right, verse 12 is John talking to those, he says, little children. This is uh, new believers. These are uh, less spiritually mature believers. Uh, you've heard me talk about it before. Just because somebody has been in church for uh, many years doesn't mean that they are spiritually mature, okay? So he is talking to new Christians and, and still kind of those baby Christians here. Now, why is he starting with them? Because of this. He knows that we are going to sin, and he also knows that Satan loves to accuse the brethren. So John wants to settle into these new believers, these baby Christians' hearts, this truth. You are forgiven. Why? For his name's sake. That This is reminding, because it's taking us back to the promises of God in chapter 1, verse 9. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. John wants them to know this truth. If you have confessed, which is agreeing and turning from your sin, you are saved. Now, 
this doesn't excuse our sin. Sin should not be a norm in the life of a child of God. But it does give us confidence in our relationship with God because in Christ we have already been forgiven. How do we know that? Because of chapter 2 verse 2. He is the propitiation, his satisfaction. So because Jesus' death satisfied God the Father's wrath against sin, we can be forgiven. Not only that, but Jesus is our advocate pleading his blood on our behalf. So he wants, and I believe that God wants those of you here who may be new Christians, those of you watching online, new Christians or, or young in your faith, he wants you to know, listen, when Satan comes to tempt you to despair, you can shut him up. Now, we're going to talk about how here in a little bit, but he wants you to know you are forgiven. Here's the second way John wants them to have a firm foundation. You have an equal standing. So there in verse 13, he talks about fathers. Now, that's going to be the more spiritually mature, but then he talks about you young men. Okay, so these are saved. that They're more spiritually mature than the little children, but they're, they're not, you know, really far along here. Now, he's writing to them because he wants to remind them of, of a very important truth, a truth that I think churches today could really stand a reminder of it. Here it is. The further we get from the cross, the more we forget where Jesus found us. So I think we need to be reminded of where Jesus found us. When he saved us. See what happens so often. Is as we grow and we mature in our faith. And we've been saved for many, many years. It becomes a whole lot easier. Uh, easier for us to become frustrated by the world. We, we get angry for the ways that they are rejecting Jesus. And we become more vocal in our condemnation of their sin, instead of being compassionate towards the sinner. Now, I'm not saying that we turn the other way or we water down what God calls a sin. We have to call it out. But at the same time, their sin should clue us in spiritually that they still need a Savior. The same way that the Holy Spirit clued you and I in through our sin that we needed to be saved. Okay, so in, instead of getting angry and condemning, really we need to become more compassionate because what's happening is this. They hear everything that we are against, but seldom do they hear about God's remedy. Yes, we are sinners. Yes, we are condemned. Yes, we would be going to hell had it not been for Christ. But that's the point. Jesus came, and they need to hear that. Or sometimes what happens with, with these young men uh, John's describing is we become frustrated with new Christians or, or those less spiritually mature. We tend to think that just because we know something, that means everybody knows something, right? Like that uh, conversation you were supposed to have with somebody and, and then they go, well, I didn't know about it. You're like, yeah, you did. I told you. No, you really didn't. And then it dawns on you. Oh, wait. No, I really didn't. Sorry. We tend to think, well, every Christian knows this. But the reality is not every Christian knows what you know. In this room and those online, listen, every one of us is in a different place spiritually. And we need to recognize that. We need to act appropriately. But when we get frustrated with these new Christians or, or these newer believers, instead of becoming compassionate and long-suffering, we become short-tempered, and we treat them as though they are somehow inferior to us. We, we kind of get up on a spiritual high horse like, ha, I know that and you don't. But this is the exact opposite of what Scripture is calling and commanding us to do. Okay, listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, 
urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, forbearing one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. So listen to what he says. He says, every one of you walk worthy of the calling, which means there's no room for pride, but humility. Okay, and he, he says, you've received this calling, so you need to be humble. You need to remember where God found you. You need to remember that any spiritual growth you have has been because God has given it to you. Okay, with gentleness. Okay, uh, what does Proverbs say? That a gentle answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. With patience. Again, realizing not everybody knows what you know. And this is forbearing one another. Now, the word forbear means to put up with. It's to tolerate. What? Not sin. We're not tolerating sin. We're tolerating the fact that not everybody is at the same place spiritually. So what I need to do in this instance, if I am to forbear with a weaker Christian, it, I need to give grace to those who are less mature than I am. And in humility, I need to love them enough to help them to learn what I know. See, this is a process of passing on the faith once delivered to the saints. It is to understand that God has saved you. Okay, uh, Robbie Gallaty puts it this way. He says, the gospel came to you on its way to somebody else. That's a great way to think about it. Now, why? When we walk in humility and gentleness and patience and we put up with one another, then we keep the unity of the Spirit. Whereas if I'm prideful, if I'm angry, if I'm short-tempered, if I'm annoyed by you because you don't know what I know or you're not living the way I think you should, instead of giving unity, what does it do to the church? It creates division. And that's the opposite of what Scripture calls us to do. So to those young men, spiritually, or young women, obviously, okay, to those who are, are more mature than the new babes in Christ, what does the Scripture say? Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. In other words, remember where God found you. Remember how humble, how gracious and patient God was with you and forbearing with you. And then turn it to them. It's part of how we love one another as Christ loves us. The third foundational truth that Paul writes is in verse 14. And it is this. It's a beautiful one. You are adopted. Most of you here and even online know the story of uh, adoption for our family. And it's, man, it's been a beautiful thing, right? Here, here it is, okay? Catalea is not any less of a lichens because she wasn't born a lichens, okay? She has the same rights and the privileges that our boys do because the day she was adopted... She fully became a lichens. Now let's apply that over to you and I spiritually. The day that God gave us life when we were dead, when we were saved. All the rights, the promises, the privileges of being a child of God were given to you. So go back to, you know, we have an equal standing, right? So here's the thing. Whether you have been saved for 50 years or you've been saved for 50 hours, it doesn't matter because you are all fully and equally a child of God with all the rights, responsibilities, promises given to one another. So John writes in, the, in this text twice, he, he says, we have known the Father. And that idea of known the Father is uh, it's carrying with it the idea of adoption. It's more than just knowing of God mentally. It's that we are known by God. Think about it as a parent. When your child screams or, or cries or laughs, 
you don't have to really look and see if that's your child, do you? Why? Because you know them. You know it about them. Kind of reminds us of what Jesus said in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. They won't follow anybody else. Why? Because they know the Father. They know Jesus' voice as the shepherd. Now how do we learn it? Because we have been adopted into God's family. We who were once children of wrath because of God's love displayed by Jesus' death and resurrection, we are now fully the children of God. This is why John opens chapter 3 by writing, Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What manner of love He's just lavished on us because we're His children. You have been adopted. But what does this mean for you and I? Well, I think the first place that we have to start is this. That some of you in this room and even on the live stream, you may not have a firm foundation. You may not have an equal standing because you haven't been adopted by the Father. You go, well, well, that's not nice. I want to be adopted by the Father. Well, here's the good thing. He has made a way that that's possible. But it's not your works. It's not your effort. It's trusting in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That there's no other way that you can be saved but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So for those of you who, who have never confessed your sin, who have never turned from your sin in faith to Jesus, the Father is saying, come. He's calling for you to turn from your sin and surrender to Him. That's how you get this firm foundation with the fact that you are forgiven and have an equal standing and that you've been adopted. But the application number two is this. Be intentional. Be intentional in two ways. First, to grow personally in your faith and your relationship with Jesus. Now, we, we talked about how John is writing to counteract some false teachers uh, that are harming this church. And in so doing, we want to highlight two weapons that God has given every child of God to fight off these uh, attacks. The first one is the Holy Spirit. See, when Satan accuses me of not being good enough, the first thing I need to do is go, you're exactly right, I'm not good enough. Why? Because then the Spirit reminds me that my standing with God is not based on my works, but rather the finished work of Jesus on the cross. The reality is, on my own, I would never be acceptable to God. I wouldn't even go looking for God. But in Christ... Jesus took my shame and my sin and gave me his right standing with God. Therefore, when Satan accuses me, the Spirit reminds me that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul says in Romans 8.1. Because I'm in Christ, I have been declared not guilty and set free. This is why you need the, the Spirit the Spirit is the proof that you belong to God. Here's the second weapon He has given you. He has given you His Word. When temptations come my way, God has given me His Spirit to alert me and His Word to redirect me. Some of you are walking in defeat this morning 
because you are not using the, you're not settling in the spirit or in the word. You can have victory over temptation. You can know that you are doing God's will because God has given you the spirit and he has given you the word. You just have to use them. Avail yourself of every tool that God has given you. This is why being in the Word is so vital for you, Christian. You're not going to, to grow if you're not in the Word. Um, back in May, there were, the very end of May, there was a report sent out on the state of the Bible in America. And, and so there was actually some really good news coming out of 2020. Okay, um, It said this, that more Americans opened their Bible than at any time in this previous decade. So let, let's just praise God for that, right? People were, were opening their Bibles. That's incredibly encouraging to me as a pastor, but there was also a very discouraging part. Not only was it discouraging, I, I've got to be really honest with you, church, it was really, really troubling. It said that less than 60% of churchgoers said they read their Bible more than once a week. 12% said they never or rarely open their Bible. So let's just put this into perspective. Between 40 to 50% of church goers, regular church goers, they open their Bible one time a week, Sunday mornings. And out of that 40 to 50 percent, 12 percent don't even do it then. Church, we don't have to look very far to ascertain why the church is so weak in its witness and why it is stumbling, why leaders are failing left and right, and why the number of people who claim no religious affiliation is growing by leaps and bounds year after year after year. It's because the church doesn't look any different than the world because we're not using the Spirit, we're not praying, and we're not studying God's Word. But this is what I want you to hear th this morning, okay, that if you want to see God change you, if you want to see God strengthen your marriage and your family, if you want to see the church strengthened, if you want to see the community reached and a great awakening in our country and around the world, then it's only going to happen as we get more desperate for God. And what I mean by desperate is that we will do anything and everything. We will forsake all other things for the purpose of praying and getting in the Word and obeying the Word. See, church, it's not that God doesn't want to pour out His Spirit. It's that many of those who claim to be His aren't even asking. This is why Peter said, for now is the time that the judgment must begin in the house of God. Listen to me, dads. This is our number two responsibility. Our number one is, is our wife and leading her in faith in Christ and in Scripture. Number two is your family. We cannot afford to fail at this. we got to be intentional about praying, and we got to be intentional about being in the Word. Here's the second thing I want you to be intentional about. Help others grow in their faith in Jesus. Maybe you're more spiritually mature than, than most people here this morning. Maybe your walk is closer with God than others. That's great. How about instead of judging those around them, that you pray with them, you pray for them, and then you do this, you commit to helping them grow spiritually. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual will restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you become tempted. See, when you help others grow in the faith, 
It's going to help keep pride down in your life. And it's going to replace it with humility. Why? Because in helping them, it's going to remind you of where you used to be. And it's going to evoke praise because God has brought you to where you are. Here's the other blessing in it. As you help them grow in maturity to where you are, guess what? God at the same time is going to start growing you. And so both of you are going to be growing together. So what's going to end up happening, watch this, remember back in Ephesians? That is, we have humility and gentleness and patience and forbear with one another. What? We have the unity. We grow in that unity. So as both of you continue to grow in Christ's likeness, it's going to strengthen your relationship with God. It's going to strengthen their relationship with God. It's going to strengthen your fellowship with one another, which is going to result in this, a stronger, more united church. That is going to reflect the glory of God to the world around them. So let me ask you something. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Those of you watching this live stream, have you surrendered to Jesus? If not, I want to call you. I want to plead with you. Let today be that day. That God unveils your eyes to see the fact that you are a sinner who is rebelling against him. But in love he sent Jesus to die in your place. That if you will surrender in faith, he will not only cleanse you and forgive you, but he will save you. You will be one of his children. You will be adopted into his family. In a moment here, we're going to give you a chance to respond. For those of you that are watching online, if you want to know more or, or you want to take that step of faith, I'm going to encourage you to do me a favor. Email us, prayer at westlakebaptist.org. If you'll just send that to us, somebody's going to get in touch with you. and We want to help you begin to walk with the Lord. We want to help you to begin to grow. But I also want to challenge you Who are you investing in right now? See, if all you do is show up and get fed, but you don't share it, then frankly, you have become a a drain. And God calls you to be a fountain. Who are you investing in right now? The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these same things to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. That was Paul's charge to Timothy. That was God's charge uh, to the disciples. Paul to Timothy, to us. Who are you investing your life in? If you don't know, start praying. Ask, Lord, who can I start investing in? Or if you're here and you're going, you know what, I'm not really spiritually mature, but I want to be, then do this. Start praying, Lord, who would you have me in this church? Who would you have to help me grow in my walk with you? And then trust the Lord from there. But let's not remain the same. Would you stand with me as we're going to pray together? Father, we praise you for this morning and this opportunity just to study your word. And Now, God, as you have spoken, as you have called out to us, God, may we respond, whether it's for salvation, for confession of sin, or, Lord, to simply say, how would you have me to invest in someone else? Lord, God, would we listen to you? In Jesus' name, amen.